All right, let's talk about chapter 16. This is going to be a medical other um, medicine applies fundamental knowledge to provide basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. Okay, and um, we're going to talk about it a little bit more in depth as we go along, but making that destination decision is going to be a very critical um, decision as far as medical patients a lot of times getting that facility dependent care. So assessment and management of the medical complaint, um, pathophysiology assessment and management of medical complaints that include transport mode and destination decision. Um, awareness of a patient who may have an infectious disease and assessment and management of a patient who may have an infectious um, a patient that may have HIV or Hep B and antibiotic resistant infections. Infection. So the current infectious disease is prevalent in the community itself. So that's a lot of stuff we're going to go over in this chapter, and we'll just go, go ahead and get started. Patient experience either a medical emergency and trauma emergency are both put together, and sometimes it can be both. Um, so you have to be very diligent in your assessment and making sure that if you do have both, you kind of put both assessments together um, so that you cover all bases for this patient. So if you have that medical patient, that, um, that trauma presenting patient that initially had a medical concern um, and it turned into a fall, which turned into a trauma patient. Um, tra trauma and emergencies, the injuries result from physical forces applied to the body, medical emergency, illnesses, or conditions caused by disease. So sometimes the medical emergencies, respiratory, um, they could include asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. Cardiovascular um, emergencies are caused by conditions affecting, affecting the circulatory system. Um, myocardial infarctions and heart failure, neurological emergencies involving the brain may include seizures, stroke, or fainting, a sickle episode. Um, gastrointestinal emergency including appendicitis, diaphytic colitis, and pancreatitis. Um, urological emergency that may involve kidney stone. The most common endocrine emergencies are caused by complications from diabetes or hematologic blood-related emergencies. May be resort for sickle cell disease or various types of blood clotting disorders such as hemophilia. Um, immunological emergencies involve the body's response to foreign substances, allergic reactions. Um, Immunological medical emergency that resorts when a body ever reacts to a foreign substance. So they can range from fairly minor conditions to life threatening anaphylaxis. A toxic emergency that includes poison and substance abuse, resulting in many other types of medical emergencies. A psychological and behavioral emergencies may be especially difficult to manage because patients often do not present with typical signs of symptoms. Sometimes these patients can turn on you very quickly and you not realize it. So um, be very careful with these patients in your assessment. Make sure you, you get a full understanding of what's going on. Um, Gynecological emergencies will most likely be challenging to, for you because there is little you can do to treat these patients in the pre-hospital setting. So these patients need to get to a um, um, GYM specialist. So a assessment of a medical patient um, is similar to that of a trauma patient but with a different focus. So you need to get that nature of illness. You're not looking for that mechanism of injury. Um, some symptoms and patients' chief complaints. Sometimes chief complaints can be very, very difficult to um, get get these patients to narrow down. So sometimes it does take some work. Uh, information received from dispatch can be helpful in anticipation of what you may be, what you may find when you arrive on the swing. Uh, a traumatic injury can be a medical emergency or vice versa. Be careful with cylindrical, internal vision. Um, don't get too focused in on something um, that you missed something else. So do that 360 
of that scene. See if you can make sure that you, you've caught up everything. That's why I say when you do your patient assessments, you're doing the same way every time. Um, you will, you'll come more um, comfortable with your patient assessments, and you'll know that you haven't missed anything because of the redundancy that you use. So ensure that that scene is safe. Um, follow your standard um, precautions when you respond to an emergency. After determining the number of patients needed assistance, um, consider whether or not additional help will be needed due to your nature of illness. Um, you know, whether you need that permanent level help, you know, you got some systems have certain policies that they have to follow with patients with certain chief complaints. They have to be assessed by paramedics. So if you if you work in a system like that, make sure that you call for your um, medics. That way they know to come on. Um, index of suspension is an awareness and concern for potentially serious underlying and unseen injuries or illness. All right, form a general impression. Um, keep in mind these conditions of many medical patients may not appear serious at first. So determine the patient's level of consciousness using the ask who scale. Um, that's alert, breathe, alert, verbal, painful, and unresponsive as far as um, their LOC. Um, identify life threats by quickly assessing the patient's airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. We'll talk about those. All right, airway and breathing. Um, in response to patients, ensure the airway is open and breathing is adequate. Consider applying oxygen if breathing has been affected. For unresponsive patients, make sure to open the airway. Using the proper technique and take several seconds to evaluate their breathing. Unresponsive patients may need airway adjuncts and ventilatory assistance with a bag valve mask. So don't forget about your OPAs and MPAs and non-rebreathers. So um, try to get, try to make sure that you, if you do have that inadequate airway, that you go ahead and treat it very quickly. Um, sometimes that needs to be done. Sometimes hypoxemia causes that autoimmune status and something this simple can, can correct. All right, it says circulation. Check for radio pulse and um, response of patient. Check for that carotid pulse and unresponsive patient. Um, observe the patient's skin color, temperature, and condition. So quickly glance, glance around the, to identify any life threats such as severe bleeding and injury to the chest. So the Patients who should be considered in serious condition and in need of rapid transport um, have or patients that are unresponsive or who have an auto mental status, airway or breathing problems, and patients with obvious circulation problems such as severe bleeding or signs of shock. So those those patients that need to be on scene less than 10 minutes, um, kind of treat them like trauma patients so that you can get that that care directed and um, cared for pretty quick. So your history taken is going to be very important on a medical patient. Um, you're going to have to be very investigative. Sometimes you're not going to be told everything. Um, you're going to have to become like a, the crime scene manager when you walk into a medical patient sometimes. Sometimes it's not obvious what exactly is going on with these patients. Um, the family gives you and the patient gives you several different things that may be going on, and you're trying to narrow it down to be able to treat these patients um, adequately. So investigate that chief complaint. Um, sometimes they'll give you what has been going on for the past year to 20 years, um, and you need to know what has acutely changed for them to call today. So history taking may be the only way to determine the problem or what may be causing the problem. So investigate the nature of illness by asking questions about the chief complaint and obtain that sample history. So please don't forget sample. You know, I personally use it every time I go to a thing. I may not do, do it in a um, um, repetitive order, but as people are talking, I'm thinking, well, that takes care of S in my sample, and that takes care of A. So uh, that's signs of symptoms, allergies, you know, the medication, 
mainly met past partner medical history, uh, medications, you know, and I just did that out of order. So, and with medications, try to take those that are, have been recently um, prescribed and they're recently taken and use them. So they may have some there that's from years and years. So last oral intake, you know, just because they go to surgery or knee surgery and events leading up to the um, reason why they call us. All right, ask questions about the present illness by using the mnemonic um, OPQRST. So ask any follow-up questions, recording allergies, medical conditions, any medications the patient that the patient take. Um, ask if the patients are compliant with their drug regimen. Um, so, you know, we're, we're starting to see a lot of patients now that aren't compliant due to cost um, and financial issues. So sometimes you, you really have to understand and know um, are they really are they really compliant or not. Look around the scene for evidence that may also be that may also help you determine the history of the patient. Um, you may see little one cc syringes around. You know, you, there's a lot of different things that patients can do with those syringes. Um, a lot of times they were, those are insulin syringes, um, and a lot of people store store those and discard those in many different ways. Um, or they could be, you know, signs of something else. If the patient is on response, we try to retain as much of the patient's medical history as possible from family members, friends, or bystanders, or from the scene itself. So, you know, once again, you, you've got to go into that investigative state. Sometimes you just you have to be nosy. Um, sometimes that's my problem. I'm, I'm getting a little too nosy sometimes when people ask me questions of what I'm doing. So just a reminder on OPQRST onset, um, what provokes the quality of the um, sign, does it radiate, you know, the time, and the severity of it on a scale of 1 to 10. All right, we're getting into the secondary assessment um, designed to identify any signs and symptoms of illness or injury that were not found during the primary assessment may occur on the scene on a route to the emergency department. So if that patient is critically ill or injured, the transport time is short, you may not have time to conduct a secondary assessment. You know, you may be less than one mile away from the hospital. So, you know, you, you spent 10 minutes on thing and you're rolling and you're trying to do IVs and, and get all of this stuff done you know, in route to the hospital. So sometimes that secondary assessment can't be done. A response medical patient may not need a full body exam, but perform a little focus assessment based on their chief complaint. You know, chest pain patients that, you know, they don't need, um, you know, PMS and looking for lacerations on their leg unless something's just really obvious. And you might have a trauma patient also. So get that good set of baseline vital signs, you know, please, please, please. Um, um, do that manual reading first on blood pressures. Um, that, that automated blood pressure or not non-invasive blood pressure um, is a machine, and you need to be able to uh, guide that that machine blood pressure versus that manual blood pressure, depending on that manual blood pressure. Uh, depending on your local protocol concern, obtain a blood glucose level and a pulse oximetry reading. So those have become pretty standard pretty much everywhere, and especially here in the state of North Carolina. So, um, Complete the primary survey and reassess the chief complaint. Reassess your patient's vital signs. You're looking for training when you do that. In those, um, um, you're looking for training with those vital signs once you're doing them again. So you're looking for changes of level of consciousness. You're reassessing um, everything that you just done. You may need to re-examine your transport decision. You know, as your your vital sign has changed, you may hey, say, hey, this is getting this place is getting worse, and I may need to take them to um, a different facility that's going to offer a different um, dependent care. So, um, review all the treatments that have been performed and ensure that all are still effective. So everything that you've done, you know, you need to trend and reassess those things. You put on something like O2, 
hopefully you got a, an initial baseline thoughts oxygen, you know, possibly without oxygen. So now you put them on oxygen. So you want to reassess to see if that pulse ox has come up. You know, in case it hasn't, then you may need to change your method of delivery as far as that medication is concerned. You give oil glucose to a hypoglycemic patient. Um, sometimes it does take oil glucose a while to actually metabolize and get into the system to show, you know, in the capillaries um, that it has been effective. So, you know, you have to, sometimes you have to give it a chance to actually work before you um, reassess it too. All right. Most medical emergencies require a level of treatment beyond the available, beyond that available in the pre-hospital setting. So primary pre-hospital treatment address the symptoms more than the acute disease process. Uh, administration of medications is limited by for advanced EMT. Um, we kind of do have a, a set of, of medications that we can use, and we kind of direct it on how to use them. As you move along, your, your medication set will expand and become more. So when the protocols may allow administration of certain medications without calling for online medical control, and I'll be standing orders on your protocols, um, do that complete thorough assessment of the patient before you get medical control and get involved for permission to give other medications. So please remember to do that within your scope of practice also. Um, so don't don't go try to give them medications just because you know what they are and what they're doing and it's outside of your scope. So it um, might have caused you a little bit of problems. Um, once you document that, then it may not be a good outcome. Uh, vaccine MTs can use an automated external defibrillator, an AED on a patient who is pulse is going to All right, sting times may be longer for a medical patient than for trauma patients. You know, we can ex extend those sting times out to 20 minutes. Um, gather as much information as possible from the scene to transmit to the emergency department. Critical patients always need rapid transports, patients with AMS, airway, breathing circuit um, difficulties, and any signs of circulatory compromise. Your, um, patients who are very old, very young. So, you know, and a lot of that is going to depend on their signs and symptoms and, you know, that qualification of being an acutely ill patient. Um, we do do those, um, those kind of standard um, not less life threatening transport sometimes. Um, so we, we don't have to be in a hurry with those a lot of times. If a life threatening condition exists, the transportation should be should include lights and sirens. Um, however, be careful with that. And, you know, I do urge you on the side of caution now um, due to um, vehicles, how soundproof they are. Sometimes you can get to a destination without lots of sirens just as quick as you can with it. So if the patient is not critical, consider non emergency transport. So. Well, modes of transport ultimately come in one of two categories ground or air. Ground transport EMS units are generally to, um, staffed by an advanced life support agencies or paramedics. And an EMT. Um, sometimes they're staffed with paramedics also in basic or, um, or paramedics and an advanced EMT. So air transport EMS or critical care transport units are generally staffed by critical care nurses and critical care paramedics. So usually those agencies, um, they dictate what they staff their, their personnel, their units with their helicopters and their critical care units. So a lot of times it is a critical care paramedic and then a critical care nurse. These people usually have three to four years of experience inside of an ED or on the street, and then they get some extra training and extra credentialing. Um, however, you may run into a critical care paramedic and a respiratory therapist on some unit. Um, you may run into a critical care paramedic and um, another critical care paramedic or a paramedic or um, an advanced EMT or basic, you know, on those units. 
So it really depends on the agency. But these these folks can do a little bit more um, due to their training. A lot of times it's the multiple pump related, um, multiple pump um, drugs on a pump, on an IV pump being administered to these patients uh, due to many complications. All right, destination selection, generally the closest hospital where emergency pump should be your destination. So, but, however, there are times that they may benefit from going to another hospital capable of handling his or her condition. The patient experiences cardiovascular during the transport and immediately in reroute to the closest hospital when, with emergency facilities. Contact medical control when unsure. Some patients may benefit from on-scene treatment provided by paramedics. Um, so, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be your non-urgent patients that can go to an emergency department um, without any specialty care being offered to that patient. However, those patients that are acutely ill um, and the medical related, um, they may need to, they may benefit from a facility that is going to um, involve that specialty care immediately. Like it's in house and, it, and it's readily available. So um, as we talk about different different medical cases, we'll talk about those facilities also. An infectious disease is a medical condition caused by growth or spread of a harmful organism within the body. A communicable disease is a disease that can be spread from one person to another. So your general assessment, assessment principle, approach the patient when infectious disease, like you would any other medical patient, do not single these patients out. Do not try to um, deter yourself from assessing these patients. These patients need to be assessed just like you would all other patients. Size up that thing. Take your PPE very seriously. Um, perform the primary survey and history taking. So get your typical chief complaint. Um, it may include fever, nausea, rash, um, pleuritic chest pain, um, and difficulty breathing. This is that chest pain that they're going to describe, like um, soreness and, and it like sometimes it's rubbing and itchy. Um, not that substernal pain that you know, feels like something sitting on the chest and that radiating. Pain. So a lot of times, this um, infectious disease chest pain will be non-radiating. Um, focus on any life-threatening conditions. Identify the um, identified in the primary survey. So be empathetic to these patients. Please, you know, you place the patient in a position of comfort on the stretcher to keep warm. Follow your standard precautions. Precautions always follow your agency exposure control plan. And clean your equipment and properly discard any disposable supplies as a as when. So your agency may have a disposable control plan um, as far as exposures to infectious diseases. Um, it's another reason why most of our equipment is um, disposable anyway. But that equipment that's got to be reused on the next call, we may have standard policies as far as cleaning it and want to use to clean it. So just make sure you follow that stuff. Um, if you have to take it further than that, make sure you get you know follow that plan. That's just you know decoding a complete unit um, as far as what you use to do that too. So. All right, some common and serious communicable diseases. HIV and AIDS, um, first identified in the late 70s. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, more than 1.2 million people in the United States are infected with this virus. Gay and bisexual men, particularly young African-American, gay and bisexual men account for the majority of the new diagnosis. HIV infection is a potential hazard only when um, deposited on a mucous membrane or directly into the bloodstream. So this is primarily a sexual transmitted disease, and it can be also a bloodborne disease. It can be transmitted from a pregnant woman through her infant in the birthing process. 
it's also transmitted through blood transfusion. In a person with an HIV infection, the entire immune system begins to fall, um, allowing life-threatening opportunistic infections to flourish. So, some signs and symptoms include acute free brow, um, a general malaise, um, fatigue, sore throat, swollen spleen, and lymph glands, headache, weight loss, and possibly a rash. A crowd immune acquired immunodeficiency syndrome it is the end stage disease process caused by HIV infection. So, a patient with AIDS is extremely vulnerable to the numerous bacteria, viral, and fungal infections that will not affect a person with an intact immune system. So pre hospital management of, age of HIV and AIDS is supportive. Um, there is no vaccine yet. And it exists to protect against HIV and AIDS. So despite great progress in drug treatments, AIDS is still fatal. So it is not easily transmitted in the EMS work setting. So it's far less contagious than Hep B. Your risk of infection is limited to exposure to an infected patient's blood and bodily fluids. Because your patients, many patients who are infected with HIV do not show any symptoms, always take precautions to prevent infection including always wear your proper type of gloves, take great care in handling the disposing of needles and scalpels, um, cover any upper wounds that you have whenever you are on the job, practice good hand washing technique and routine ambulance cleaning and after transport. Um, seek medical advice as soon as possible for any potential exposure. Um, my only soapbox about HIV and AIDS, you know, we've gone through that period that they will tell us um, these people were telling that they were infected, and I think we've kind of generally gotten back into that no-tell kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, just be careful. Make sure that you're wearing your PPE. Um, a lot of times these patients are just uh, with that fever. Um, they generally just don't feel good. So we're doing a lot of supportive measures um, in the pre-hospital field. So take that good set of auto signs. You know, get that accurate check. Um, so... Just make sure that you follow your um, cleaning after you transport these patients if they do openly tell you about you know, their infection. All right, the flu. Um, influenza is commonly known as the flu. Um, those with chronic medical conditions compromise the immune system. The very young and the very old are particularly susceptible as transmitted by direct contact with nasal secretion, um, aerosolized droplets from coughing, and sneezing by infected people. H1N1 virus initially identified as swine flu in 2009 is a specific form of influenza. Um, general treatment includes supportive measurements, so influenza and other potential serious diseases can be passed by the respiratory route. So always, always wear PPE, put your hand washing, maintain your vaccinations if you get them, and place a surgical mask on the patient with respiratory disease. So you need to wear a HIPAA respirator during um, aerosol generating procedures such as nebulize. Um, an annual influenza immunization is important, especially for EMS personnel to protect both providers and patients. Seems like we go through two or three flu seasons, and especially here in North Carolina because the weather changes so much um, during the winter. Um, so be very careful with these patients. Can we test the flu yet? No. Um, there's a whole lot you can do for the flu. No. Um, but be supportive of it. You know, treat their, that respiratory. It does cause some patients to be um, very sick, um, very major hits on the respiratory tract, so you may have to give those NEB treatments to help clear up their lungs due to um, mucus and bacteria growing. So, but be careful yourself. Try not to contact, make contact with those droplets. Just be careful with the flu because it seems like when it hits one person in our team, it, it makes its way around. So even here at your local base, uh, we 
you know, we generally lost all and wiped down everything. All right. Hepatitis, um, inflammation, and also infection of the liver can be caused by a number of different viruses and toxins. Complications of hepatitis include scarring of the liver, liver cancer, and liver failure. According to the CDC, hepatitis C accounted for the highest mortality in the United States in 2014 of the three types of hepatitis. So depending on the severity, patients with hepatitis may be asymptomatic or may have a variety of signs and symptoms. So look for that loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting frequently, um, fever, fatigue, sore throat, cough, neck muscle, and joint pain. So I would put that loss of appetite with this jaundice. Um, you know, this does occur seven weeks later. A lot of times they'll call you out there because they've experienced a rapid weight loss, um, and then they start noticing that their skin is yellow in the, in the eyes, and they kind of look greenish. And then they got a right upper quadrant abdominal pain also. All right, so management is strictly supportive. Um, check the vital signs, the hypertension, you know, full boluses, treat fevers. Um, if you can give that antihistamine, that that medication in your area at the, you know your level, you know, uh, right now in standard Carolina, it's not available to their advanced EMTs, but um, you know, something that's different to their frame sometimes can help these patients with nausea and vomiting. So, that's not a sure way to tell which patients are contagious. Um, toxins induced hepatitis is not contagious. A carrier is a person or animal in whom an infectious organism has taken up permanent residence um, and may or may not cause an active disease. So carriers may never know what they harbor. They may never know that they harbor the you know, organism, but they can infect others. Hepatitis A is transmitted orally or through oral and fecal contamination. Organisms that cause hep B, C, and G are transmitted through vehicles other than through vehicles other than food and water. So, um, hep B is far more, far more contagious than HIV. Vaccinations um, with hep B vaccine are highly recommended for advanced EMTs and all people um, providers of EMS. So, not everyone who is vaccinated develops immediate immunity to the virus. So, seek testing after vaccination to determine your immune status. All right, herpes, um, common virus strain carried by humans. More than 85% of uh, people carrying the virus are asymptomatic. Um, symptomatic infections cause eruptions of any fluid-filled blisters called fiscals that often appear on the lips or genitals. The herpes simplex can cause serious illnesses like pneumonia and meningitis in the very young, very old, and um, immunocompromised patients. The primary mode of infection is through close, pers close personal contact. Um, syphilis, although syphilis is commonly thought of as a sexually transmitted disease, it is, it is also a bloodborne disease. So there is a small risk of transmission through contaminated needle stick injuries and direct blood to blood contact. The initial infection with syphilis produces a lesion called a chancar, um, and they are commonly located in the genital region. Meningitis. All right, meningitis is the inflammation of meningeal coverings of the brain and spinal cord. Um, Signs and symptoms include fever, headache, stiff neck, and autoimmune status. So that's stiff neck, the thing for meningitis. Oh. It can be caused by viruses or bacteria, most of which is, are not contagious. One form of meningitis, um, cockle meningitis, um, is highly contagious. Our laboratory tests can sort out the different forms of meningitis. So just take your standard precautions, wear your gloves and a mask, and this will go a long way to prevent your patient's secretions from getting into your nose and mouth. Vaccines are rarely used and treat at the emergency department with antibiotics. After treating a patient with meningitis, contact your employer um, health representative. So 
many times it's reportable. So in such states, you may be in contact with me if one of the patients you handle is diagnosed. TB, a chronic uh, microbacterial disease that usually strikes the lung. Many infected patients are well most of the time. If the disease involves the brain or kidneys, the patient is only slightly contagious. Disease that occurs shortly after infection is called primary tuberculosis. Reactive tuberculosis is common and can be much more difficult to treat, especially because an increase in number of tuberculosis trains have growth resistance to most antibiotics. But patients who pose the highest risk of most all, almost always have a cough. So consider respiratory tuberculosis, tuberculosis to be the only contagious form because it is the only one that is spread by airborne transmission. Droplets produced by coughing are not the real problem, but rather the droplet nuclei. Um, this is where the remnants of the droplets after the excess water has evaporated. Use of an N95 or HEPA mask are required to prevent inhalation of droplet nuclei. For a patient with dyspnea wearing a non rebreather mask, oxygenate the patient while preventing the droplets from spreading to the advanced EMT. So there is no absolute protection from infection with the um, tubercular bacterialis does not exist. Everyone who breathes is at risk and according to the CDC, one third of the world's population is infected with tuberculosis. The vaccine for tuberculosis is called baculus. Um, is only really used in the United States. So, you know, you remember that that prevalent cough that these patients have. Um, a lot of times they'll tell you also, but place these patients on an artery breather um, that way that those droplets are not being spread and coughing, you know, as much. Make sure you wear PPE, um, a HEPA mask, N95 mask. And when you get done with your ailments, keep it on. Walk back out, and you need to decon the ailments very, very good. Uh, a lot of times it just takes, you know, sometimes you have to ride with the windows down with these patients to help that air circulate, turn on that exhaust fan in the back um, so that you can, you know, get that, that those droplets possibly circulated out. All right. Um, whoop cough is an airborne disease caused by bacteria. Um, it's previously affected children young, younger than six years. Um, it's becoming more common in adults and vaccinations was years prior and whose immunity has decreased. Symptoms include fever and the whoop sound that occurs when the patient tries to inhale after a coughing attack. The best way to prevent infection from pertussis is to be vaccination, vaccinated with the tetanus um, and DTAP vaccine. For added protection, place a mask on the patient and or your and MRSA. Uh, bacteria that causes infection is resistant to most antibiotics. Uh, these infections with MRSA are believed to be transmitted from patient to patient by the unwashed hands of healthcare providers. Studies have shown that 1 to 5% of healthcare providers carry MRSA in their nares. Uh, to prevent MRSA transmission, use gloves and practice good hand washing techniques. Um, factors that increase the risk for the development of MRSA include antibiotic therapy, prolonged hospital stays, a stay in the intensive care or burn unit, and exposure to an infected patient. Incubation period for MRSA appears to be between 5 and 45 days. And exposure will not occur if you are in direct contact with wound drainage, but your skin is intact. So no, no post-exposure treatment is recommended in the case of true exposure, but the incident must still be documented. Um, so we will be, in, as far as three hospitals stand, we'll be exposed to MRSA. Uh, MRSA, not so much MRSA, MRSA uh, but MRSA, um, a lot of times it's a facility acquired um, in, in disease. So be careful with even your extended home care um, facilities such as your rest homes and you know assisted living facilities also. 
And um, these patients that come back with this, you know, especially if stay from the hospital, they do have um, a lot of therapy that goes straight to them. These patients, especially if they go back to the facility, they may have acquired this disease from. Uh, insurance companies do not like for this to be documented at facilities. So um, hospitals do take a lot of time to try to prevent this from happening. You know, this is why you see the um, um, hand wash outside of rooms and inside of rooms um, in the um, facilities. And that's why you know when you go in, you have to. Um, use those and when you come out you use them again. All right, some new and emerging diseases, hantavirus is rare, but the daily virus transmitted through rodents, urine and droplets. It's not transmitted from person to person directly, but by a vehicle such as food or a vector such as rodent. West Nile virus, we had a scare of that a couple of years ago. It, the vector is the, the carrier is the mosquito. It affects humans and birds and the disease these diseases are not communicable and pose no risk during patients. Uh, SARS, um, serious potential life threatening viral infection caused by a recently discovered family of viruses. SARS usually starts with a flu like symptoms, which may progress to pneumonia, respiratory failure, and in some cases, death. It's transmitted by close person to person contact or by secretion. Um, the bird flu. It's caused by a virus that occurs naturally in the bird population, carrying, carried by the intestinal tract of wild, wild birds, and does not usually cause illness. So in domestic bird populations, chickens, adults, and turkeys, it is very contagious. Um, if an infected bird is used for food and is cooked, it does not pose a risk to those who eat it. Um, hopefully, we cook our food at high enough temperatures. Humans can get it when they have close contact with infected birds. So, no rats in human or human cases have been reported, so the transmission risk for humans is low. Clover health issues, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus. So, most commonly found in bats and camels living in the Middle East. Some cases of human infections have also been reported in Europe and the United States. Symptoms include high fever, cough, muscle aches, vomiting, diarrhea. Presently, no cure or vaccine for the virus. And if you suspect your patient might have MERS CoV, place a surgical mask on him and her and notify the receiving facility. Ebola. Um, incubation period is approximately 6 to 12 days after exposure. Um, symptoms may not begin to appear for as long as 21 days after infection. They include watery diarrhea, vomiting, fever, body aches, and bleeding. This fatality rate can be as high as 70% if infected. Supportive treatment is not initiated. The Zika virus, um, vector borne infection, first noted in the United States in the mid 2015, transmitted by the bite of a mosquito, a certain kind of mosquito. There is no vaccine for this virus. Um, prevention is aimed at protecting against mosquito bites. So according to the CDC, most people infected with the Zika virus present with few or no symptoms. So symptoms include fever, rash, joint pain, and conjunctivitis. All right, people who travel and acquire ear after from another country can present with a variety of symptoms dependent on the ear so when you encounter a pa an ill patient with a um, recent travel history, place a mask on the patient and gather as much in information as possible. So if you suspect the patient has a communicable illness, follow appropriate PPE precautions and notify the receiving facility. So some questions. Um, where did you recently travel? Okay. Did you receive any vaccination before your trip? Were you exposed to any infectious diseases? Is there anyone else in your travel party who is sick? So which types of food did you eat? And what was your source of drinking water? Okay. This, with travel patients, this is where you and your investigations and 
questions um may seem a little personal to some of these patients however you need to explain to them that due to their travel recently there may they may have been exposed to certain diseases that they're not aware of um and this is why you're having to ask these questions uh, especially with ebola in, in these um, african region that was a really big concern um, there was a lot of people traveling to that part of the um, Africa um, at a particular time, and they knew that the Ebola, Ebola um, um, disease was very active in that area of Africa at the time. Um, a lot of these people were not drinking from um, a clean water source, uh, a known filtered water source. Um, so, you know, sometimes they were contaminated that way just from the um, that part um, of that region of that country, you know, of, um, ability to fill their water. So, you know, and a lot of times that is going to um, mediate your destination. Um, it takes a lot of prep work for these patients so that that exposure is limited um, and it does not become a contagious outbreak quickly. Um, it had even hit EMS to the point that certain ambulances were Ebola ambulances. So when you called and we had you approached, you as a street medic approached a patient with signs and symptoms and they told you they, they had travel, had recent travel outside the country um, two particular areas, uh, we sent a different um, ambulance out to you. That way that, that ambulance could stay out of service for X amount of time to be decon very um, thoroughly. Um, so be very careful with these patients that do travel. All right, the assessment and treatment of medical patients can be very challenging. Um, medical patients' conditions may not be readily apparent has in a trauma patient. Like I said, you're going to have to become that investigator um, so that you can, a lot of times, narrow down these chief complaints um, to find out why that patient called today. Uh, what has become acutely changed in their illnesses for them to call. So be calm. Use your patient assessment skills. Uh, treat these symptoms while maintaining a high index of suspicion. Report to medical control and transport these patients safely to the closest, most appropriate facility. Um, as we talk about destinations um, with these patients, they need to go to a appropriate facility. We're not naming, you know, these patients need to go to X um, hospital um, all the time, or these patients need to go to the closest hospital all the time. It is a, a facility that most appropriately cares for their signs and symptoms and what may be going on with them. So keep in mind that these patients sometimes have more than one isolated problem. All right, and that's the end of this chapter. Thank you. Population substantially exceed the number of expected based on recent experience. So this is a um, kind of like a mass casualty, but on a infectious disease kind of level. So the pandemic is an outbreak that occurs on a global scale. Um, it starts one place and it, and it begins to affect a not only your local stuff but statewide and nationwide and globally. It just kind of breaks out really quick. 